In the early 1970s, the independent studio Sun Classic began to produce what they called small, low-budget animal films. Movies that would appeal to families by having some sort of animal element, like When the North Wind Blows. The company was formed by Charles Selye Jr. and his associates Ray Jensen and Claire Farley. They had a big hit with The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams, which spun off into a TV series and a made-for-TV movie. They were deciding what to do next when they were submitted a four-year-old German film called Chariots of the Gods, which was based off the book of the same name. They bought the rights to both the book and the film for $75,000. They released them both and they were hugely successful. The film made $25 million and the book sold 8 million copies. Recognizing that unexplained phenomenon was quickly becoming the next trend, the studio branched out into making made-for-TV documentaries like The Mysterious Monsters, In Search of Noah's Ark, and The Outer Space Connection. Selye was Sun's head of production and later moved on to become the president of the company. Wanting to continue the conspiracy trend as well as make more traditional entertainment, they produced their first sci-fi film, Hangar 18, which was directed by James L. Conway, who'd been with the company for years. They wanted to follow this up with a horror movie. Conway asked to helm the project. He grew up watching the Universal Horror Monsters, so he was very excited to be able to make a creature feature. Writer David O'Malley wanted to write a script about the things that scared him and create a name for it that reflected something that everyone was afraid of. The Boogeyman. However, in 1980, there already was a movie about the Boogeyman, so he decided to base it on the myth of that old Scottish legend, The Boogins. The Scottish legend that didn't exist and he totally made up. He co-wrote the script with Thomas C. Chapman, who had just written Hangar 18. They wrote a story about creatures that lived inside an old Colorado mine that start to attack the locals when the mine is reopened. The Boogins was also loosely based off of those things that miners have seen while in the caves. Those things you see just out of the corner of your eye, or that weird feeling that something hungry is watching you, which ties back to the company's roots of unexplained phenomenon. This studio settled on a budget of around $600,000 for the production. Shortly after that, in 1980, the studio was sold by their parent company to Taft Enterprises. Unfortunately, Taft didn't buy Sun for their movies. They wanted their TV contracts. Taft liquidated the Sun movie library. Anything that wasn't locked into a contract was canceled so they could focus on TV development. However, since the Boogans was already booked for theaters in the fall of 1981, they had to allow the production to move forward. Even though Taft had no interest in the production, they still took the time to meddle with it. Selye wanted the Boogans to be journeyed to the center of the earth for the 1980s, which changed when they were sold to Taft. Since Sun was known for their family-friendly productions, Taft wanted to up the sex and violence in the film as a reflection of the new ownership. The studio originally planned to give the film a realistic tone, but Taft wanted it to be more salacious. They added in more interactions with the cast, like an overly sex-obsessed character, and they lost much of the history about the miners in the process. Going against the family-friendly nature of Sun, they decided this film would most certainly be an R-rated production. Jim Coff was hired to take the existing script and give it a rewrite to punch it up a bit. As I said in my video on The Hidden, he didn't want to be labeled as a horror writer, so he used the pseudonym Bob Hunt. Sun Classic, now under Taft, had its offices in Park City, Utah. Since the budget on the film was going to be low, they decided to keep their production in Utah and film locally. They went location scouting and found some local mines where they could film exteriors and a closed supermarket, which would give them enough room to build a mine interior set. The supermarket building was closed because the company had relocated to a larger building in another part of town. They needed a house interior, so they rented the Elks Lodge, a building that was across the street from the Sun Classic offices in Park City. They built the interior to match the look and style of the houses in the area. For casting, they traveled to Los Angeles to get their main cast, but chose some local Utah actors for many of the minor roles. When casting, they didn't know if the actors should be early 20s or late 20s. After seeing the actors, they decided the best of the bunch were in their late 20s, so they went in that direction. The director and producer were overseeing auditions. They interviewed actress Rebecca Balding and knew she was the one they wanted for the lead. Balding was just in the horror film The Silent Scream in 1979. After she left, the director turned to the producer and said, I could marry that girl. For Jessica, they hired actress Anne-Marie Martin. They hired Jeff Harlan to play Roger and Fred McCarran to play Mark. They also needed a dog for the film, so they were able to get a trained dog to play Tiger. Well, two dogs. One main dog and the other one that could do the things the main one couldn't. The director had previously worked on movies like Grizzly Adams, so he was already comfortable working with animals. 
although the dogs were incredibly well trained and ended up being very easy to work with. While all this was going on, they needed to design the look of the monster. The studio contacted various designers and asked them to bid on a job to design the Boogins. There was a problem though. They had no idea what the monster should look like. It was written as the thing that everyone was afraid of, which is, to put it mildly, open to interpretation. Visual effects artist Bill Munn was interested and flew out to meet with the team and try to figure out a design. When Munn met with the director, they still had no idea what the monster should look like. They told him to pitch them an idea. He came back with a creature that had crab-like arms and a scorpion-like tail. They didn't know what a boogans would look like, but agreed it wasn't this. They said the head was all wrong. It should be like a turtle head, with the ability to retract into its shell. A shell that they wanted to look like a sheep's brain they saw in a biological supply catalog. It should also have tentacles, in addition to its claws. Munn went back to working on a design while they continued pre-production. After some time, Munn came back to the studio with a design cost for the monster, which was about 10 times what they were willing to pay. They managed to agree on a price, which was much lower. As a way to help promote his films, Chuck Salier would hire a ghostwriter to do a novelization of whatever film was currently in production. It was an easy way to help cross-promote the film, and an additional revenue stream for the studio since the books almost always sold well. In the book, the Boogans were described as immense spiders with flexible, octopus-like tentacles in place of legs, which the director wished they could have afforded. Since they were still working under the Sun Classic structure, they used many of the same crew that worked on the previous made-for-TV movies. The FX team turned the inside of the supermarket into the mine shafts using sculpted polyurethane foam. They even built a small underground lake inside the supermarket. They started filming in January of 1980 in and around Park City, Utah. A few days into filming, the cast pulled Rebecca Balding aside for a cast meeting. The actors had all signed up to do nude scenes, but now they didn't want to do them. They said... We're not going to take our clothes off, and you shouldn't either. They figured if all of them protested, their solidarity would get them out of it. Balding was annoyed. She told them this is what they signed up for, and she was still going to do her nude scenes, even if the others didn't. The trio went to the director and refused to do their nude scenes. He was in a jam. This was a very low-budget production, and since they already started filming, it would be too difficult to recast them. So he begrudgingly let them off the hook. Still, they were now violating their contract, which they signed with their agents present, so it made filming a little uncomfortable for a few days. Although, since the nudity was something added in by Taft, the director wasn't too upset. Shortly into filming, Balding and the director, Jim Conway, were hitting it off. Three days into filming, and they went on a date, which coincidentally was the day they shot her first nude scene. That Saturday, in a surprise move, Balding proposed to Conway. The two wanted to fly out to Vegas to get married, but decided to hold off for now. They still had a movie to worry about. The exterior of the house was a facade that they built because they planned to blow it up in the finale. The inside was empty, so all the interiors were shot on the set in the other part of town. Since it was Utah in the winter, the day shoots were very cold, but the night shoots were beyond freezing. The director said most nights it was 20 below zero. Driving was treacherous, and they needed four-wheel drive vehicles to get to most of the locations. Blizzard-like conditions slowed production down at times. Filming continued and things were going along relatively smoothly. Then about halfway through filming, that all changed. One day they were filming an explosion in the mine which made the polyurethane rocks catch fire. They put out the flames and everything seemed to be fine. Little did they know that the fire was still smoldering underneath the surface and a short while later, the whole set erupted in flames. Everyone got out safely, but with the interior being filled with polyurethane, which was extremely flammable, the whole supermarket burned down in a matter of minutes. This left them with a problem. They still had scenes left to film in the mine's interior. They'd been using a real mine for the exterior, and were able to shoot the scenes they needed inside the same mine. It was cramped and much more difficult to film in than the set. About four weeks into filming, Jim Conway and Rebecca Balding had a small wedding at Jim's house in Utah. While most everyone was polite, there were grumblings about how this marriage would never last. Much later into the shoot, when it was finally ready to film the monster, the designer brought them what they asked for. The slug-like turtle sheep's brain beast with tentacles and crab claws. In the movie, there was supposed to be multiple boogans, hence the name. But since this was a very low-budget production, they were only able to afford the one. The director wasn't happy with the overall look, but recognized that they got what they paid for. 
Bill Munn, the designer, joked that this strange little creature was born through the magic of a Hollywood indecision. The arms were supposed to be animatronic, but with the extremely cold temperatures, they didn't work. So the team mostly just flung them into frame as needed. Since they didn't like the look of the monster, they tried to hide it as much as possible, only showing it in a reveal towards the end, kind of like Jaws. One of the producers insisted that they show it more, since they paid a lot of money for it, so they filmed some additional moments with the monster. As I said earlier, the house was just a facade they blew up. In hindsight, the director said he should have put something inside because when the building collapses, you can tell it's empty. The last day of filming was planned to go for 20 hours. Fred McCarran had to leave the next day for another production, so they needed to make sure to get all the footage required for the finale. The ending of the book was much different than the film. In the book, everyone dies except for a greedy landowner, a character that was not in the movie. He's happy, but then discovers hundreds of newly awakened boogans are beginning to pour through the tunnels under the town. They changed it so the survivors blew up the mine, stopping the boogans from escaping. They thought it worked much better than such a bleak ending where everyone loses. Also, since they only had one boogans, it would have been impossible to do. Filming ended in February after about six weeks. Despite the early problems with the cast, everyone got along, and aside from the cold, everyone enjoyed the shoot. The movie was released on September of 1981 and gradually made its way across the U.S. Horror author Stephen King wrote an incredibly positive two-page review of the film in Twilight Zone magazine. He called it a wildly energetic monster movie, which helped to do very well at the box office. It eventually went on to gross over $20 million. King was such a fan of the Boogans that he contacted Selye, and the two discussed working together. Selye commissioned King to do a screenplay of his book Cujo. At the time, King hadn't had a screenplay written from one of his own books produced before. King delivered the script, which Taft liked. Selye wasn't happy with the management of Taft and left the company. Unfortunately, because of that, Taft had him blacklisted from the industry. A friend from TriStar came to help and offered him the job to direct Silent Night, Deadly Night, a job he felt he couldn't turn down. If you want to know more about that story, I did a video on it a few years back. Taft produced Cujo for Warner Brothers. Although they took the script and rewrote it so many times, King had his name removed. The Boogans made its way to cable, but due to Taft not generally being interested in films, it wasn't released on VHS. James Conway left Taft and got a job working for Aaron Spelling's production company on the TV series Matt Houston. He went on to direct and produce a variety of TV shows like MacGyver and Star Trek The Next Generation. He eventually became the executive VP of Spelling Entertainment, produced the series Charmed, and directed episodes of Smallville and Supernatural. After nearly 40 years, he's still married to Rebecca Balding. So I guess they proved all those naysayers wrong. Good for them. They'd been having conversations about when they should show their kids the horror movie they made when they met. They weren't embarrassed by the film at all. It was just a little awkward because the mom had nude scenes. They decided that when the kids were teenagers that they were old enough, and they enjoyed it. Rebecca Balding continued acting and had a long-running part in the TV series Charmed as Phoebe's boss. The Sun Classic Taft Library had been sold and resold over the years and eventually ended up being bought by Aaron Spelling's World Vision Enterprises Company. In the late 90s, Conway found out and spoke to their film distribution arm about finally getting the Boogans released on VHS. After some time, he was able to get an official release for both the Boogans and Hangar 18. A little over 10 years later, the rights were sold to Olive Films, who released both of them on Blu-ray. Anne-Marie Martin continued acting in TV shows like Sledgehammer and a long run on the soap opera Days of Our Lives. She married Michael Crichton in 1987 and went on to co-write the blockbuster Twister. She quit acting to become a competitive horseback rider. Fred McCarran continued acting in TV shows like Hill Street Blues, but left acting and was much more successful working in commercials, doing both radio and TV spots. He sadly died in 2006 of colon cancer at the age of 55, leaving behind his wife and six children. Jeff Harlan also continued acting, mostly in TV with shows like Chips and voice acting in Batman Beyond. The Boogans is an enjoyable 80s monster movie. A lot of people make fun of the look of the monster, and I don't think it's that bad. When you see it in stills, sure it looks goofy, but in the movie, I really don't think it's that bad. I have a personal anecdote about the film. When I was very young, we didn't have the movie channels on cable, but I used to try to watch them scrambled. One day I discovered the Boogans was going to be on uh, HBO, I think, and I watched the entire film scrambled. 
The audio came through fine, just the video was messy. In a way, it made it scarier. So seeing the movie that way, it kind of stuck with me over the years. Especially since the film wasn't on home video, so I wouldn't be able to see it again until decades later. Anyway, The Boogans is a surprisingly effective film. The small cast is likable, and what they were able to do with very little is impressive. The POV shots were cool, and the little things, like the Boogans opening the metal grate, showed a lot of creativity. The idea of the creatures is handled well, and aside from how silly they look, it doesn't make them less scary. Just because something's goofy looking doesn't mean it can't kill you. If this was made or remade today, it'd probably make it look like something from H.P. Lovecraft, which is getting a bit overdone at this point. I don't think a remake of this film is needed. The way the whole thing's scaled back is part of why it works. The small cast, the limited locations, and the one monster. I guarantee if they tried to remake this now, there'd be a fleet of CG boogans and it would be ten times less scary. I'll get him. No! No!